Today, I am having a conversation with Executive Director of Bridget's House of Hope with Dr. Miranda Lane, a fellow colleague from William James College and Leadership PsyD. I'm so excited to have this conversation to really dive a little bit deeper into the topic of burnout. And so you're going to want to stick around. Welcome to Rat Race Reboot. I'm your host, Laura Noel, (laughs) and as a certified coach and former 27-year military leader, each week I provide bite-sized mindset pivots that will help you reset your mind, reawaken your spirit, and regain your control. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Rat Race Reboot. As you know, if you've been following along with us on this journey, we have been hosting a number of podcasts around the topic of burnout, talking to different individuals who have experienced burnout, who've overcome burnout and seen the other side and transformed their lives, and leaders who are in the space of organizational psychology who are really making a difference out there in the world to help other leaders mitigate burnout and prevent it altogether. Um, But I'm really excited to have this conversation with Dr. Miranda Lane. Um, First and foremost, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I love being here. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And this is your (laughs) second time on Rat Race Reboot. We'll um, link the episode to our our first time together. So I'm really excited. and I think this, our conversation and your research, the work that you're doing is really going to round out this topic and, and bring it home, this idea of burnout. You know, so many of us have experienced burnout, particularly if we're in the space of organizational psychology. We've seen it somewhere. We've mm-hmm. experienced it. Um, and that's kind of a motivation for a lot of us to make a difference in organizations and in teams. But I'd love to hear your story. Um, you know, how you got here doing the work that you're doing and maybe a little bit of your experience with burnout. Yeah, absolutely. So my uh, background is as a licensed clinical mental health counselor. So I have spent uh, about eight or nine years now in the mental health field. And if you know anything about the mental health field, you know that burnout is rampant um, in any amount of human services. So I work often at the intersection of mental health, social work, human services, public health, um, victim advocacy, all of those pieces kind of combine. Um, And now in my current role, we also included housing um, and housing rights in there. So Lots of people working with a lot of really vulnerable populations were kind of set up for the burnout experience. Um, Even the burnout construct, when it was originally developed, was kind of directed toward helping professions or professions in which, you know, one person is helping another person um, because there's a particular level of like emotional investment in those relationships and things like that. So uh, I'm... I would be surprised. I don't think I have met a mental health counselor yet who has not experienced burnout in some form at some time in their life. Um, So for me, I think that happened uh, pretty early on, actually, in the first few years that I was working in the field. Um, At the time, I think I went into a role that I wasn't totally prepared for, um, that kind of hooked me in with this idea of um, like, you're going to be the person who can turn this program around. Um, You're the person that we need. And I had been in the field for a handful of years. And that was very enticing (laughs) to be told that I could maybe be the person who helps create some change somewhere. Um, But I really quickly fell into um, a pretty, pretty horrible space um, I wasn't sleeping at all. I uh, had trouble maintaining um, regular nutrition. I actually was exhibiting a lot of di- signs of disordered eating. Mm-hmm. Um, I was exhausted all of the time. I would go home and to cope. For, I got really into um, 
coloring, like mandalas and things, because it was kind of grounding and soothing, which is a like perfectly fine coping skill. But it kept to the point where I was doing it so much to just try to cope with what I needed to come down from at work that I started like injuring my hand because it was I was so stressed and tense. And um, my family was concerned about me. They were uh, worried that I was just too exhausted. I was on call all the time. Um, and I just, I like my phone would ring and I would start to cry. (laughs) How it was, you know? And, uh, now I think that that was largely just a function of that role in particular that needed to shift a bit. I wasn't the first person that burnt out on that role. Um, I don't, I, I was the last person we ended up shifting that program after me. I mean, after a little while, when we figured out it just wasn't sustainable and I moved into something else. But, you know, I really felt at the end of my time there that I wasn't a full person anymore. Um, I wasn't well. I felt like I needed to go to my doctor and talk about how I wasn't well because of that role specifically, you know, thankfully I had already been in therapy and I had that support throughout that whole time and after, but I did, um, I took a few weeks off after I ended that role. I ended up just having to leave that job and, uh, I ended up having to take a few weeks off just to recuperate, including just literally sleeping and like resting and not moving. So it was a pretty intense experience for me. Not all people who experience burnout, I think, get to that level. But but because it got to that level, um, it really inspired my research that I did in my doctoral project. It actually inspired me going into the field of organizational psychology in general. Mm -hmm. Um, I left that job being like, we have to be able to do better, right? There has to be a better way, especially in mental health. You know, we get significant training on how to work with people and help them achieve a sense of health and well-being. And yet every person I know who's in the field has worked in a place that has just really deteriorated their sense of health and well-being while they're helping others toward that. Yeah. It's the ultimate irony. So I decided to go into organizational psychology and figure out how are we going to change this so that the, this doesn't keep happening anymore. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Your, your journey sounds very familiar. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and so I want to hear all about your research. And I also have a few questions, you know, when you were in the midst of just noticing yourself, not eating well, not sleeping, the phone would ring and it would just kind of trigger a response did you realize at the time that you were in burnout or I I feel like oftentimes we sort of talk ourselves into pushing forward. Like it's us. So what was your headspace there in the midst of all of this? What drove you? Yeah, I think there was some awareness that this was not normal. Like this was not okay. Um, But I absolutely I, I know I explicitly said this to my family multiple times, even while like crying <laughs> right on the couch and crying while being like, it's all me. Like, why can't I do it? I think that was the thing. It was the refrain for me was, why can't I do this? Why is this so overwhelming to me? Other people seem to be able to do this. Why can't I do it? And uh, it took probably a couple more years, even after I left that role where, you know, halfway through my doctoral program, I stepped back into doing some part-time work. I had the privilege of being able to do that. And I was working in a private practice and I suddenly had what I think was maybe a normal amount of workload between a part-time job and a part-time doctoral program. Right. And I remember going to my therapist and just saying, so I thought that I didn't have enough energy or enough grit or gumption or whatever it was, but I think maybe I was just doing too much. And she was like, (laughs) (laughs) from the the person who preaches about wellness, it took me a really long time to just think, oh, I don't think the problem is me necessarily. 
And I, it took a while and, um, but this is kind of come full circle because in my doctoral research, I really focused on talking about how burnout isn't enough to describe some of the experiences that people experience, particularly in the mental health field. Um, that when burnout, I think there's something beyond burnout. There's maybe a, a more common level of job burnout. And then there's something that can happen that's a little step, that's a, not a little step, but a step above that where burnout might be a symptom of it. And I called that thing institutional systemic trauma. And we can talk about that in a minute. But yeah. really the purpose of that was to say, you know, burnout research even against the will of really seminal burnout researchers who write about this, um, tends to focus on the individual so much that it makes it seem like burnout is completely within the control of the person who's experiencing it. So if you're experiencing burnout, that you are the reason you're experiencing it and it's your responsibility to fix it, um, which is super dangerous to believe. And I think it does lead to people who are, you know, I'm a very intelligent, capable person who did a lot with burnout and secondary trauma and wellness and all of those things. And I still had to learn the hard way that, oh, I don't think that I'm not enough. I think it's that this is too much. And those are very different things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can think back in my career, not naming burnout earlier than, I mean, this was in the early nineties. I can think of one organization I worked in and it was definitely, it was systemic and Mm -hmm. people would leave at five. We would get to work at seven and people would leave like before five and people were kind of like looking out the door, like mm-hmm. that person's late, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it wasn't that they were necessarily working on anything or that we were, it was just the energy and the expectations or what was kind of communicated to us in actions and expectations. Um, people were afraid. People were afraid to speak up. People were watching other people. Um, people were comparing themselves to other people. Mm-hmm. Um People were exhausted. People were getting divorces <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because yeah. of the, the level of stress. And, yeah, um, and so, you know, it, it's, it is really damaging when we are in essence saying it's now, do I believe that we should self-regulate and we have full domain and we should speak up? Yes, of course. And um, I think it's, it's um, two parts to this. And I mm-hmm. think that as leaders, we have a responsibility toward our people um, Mm -hmm. to see what, what are we, what are the expectations that we're setting forth? What's, what's the culture? Um, Mm -hmm. What culture kind of culture are we exhibiting versus what are we saying we want? Um, So, yeah. So this is really incredible work. I want to hear more about this idea of that institutional, like that systemic trauma, Mm-hmm. Yeah. So actually, every what you just said at the end there was really kind of the setup for my mm-hmm. um, my research. So I studied what I called institutional systemic trauma and turnover in mental health, and I wanted to know first of all if those two things were related because turnover is an enormous problem in the field of mental health. If you ask anyone on the street, I'm pretty sure they could tell you about the workforce crisis in the field of mental health. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about that is that I have been a clinician, right, for almost 10 years. And I thought to myself, when we say, when we call something a crisis, that connotation is that it's a, a temporary period in which something is an emergency, right? The problem is that the field of mental health and social, like human services as a whole, has been experiencing a workforce crisis since the first organizations were developed. It's been it's been a term since the 1950s. It the the explicit term workforce crisis emerged in the 1990s. Um, I, so I my question was, you know, can we really call it a crisis? if it's existed the whole time 
Or is it just a part of the system at that point? You know, at what point are we going to stop calling it a crisis and say, there's something going on that's endemic to this system? And so uh, I think historically, the mental health field has pointed to burnout as kind of like the boogeyman behind the (laughs) problem. Uh, And I think that that is fair. It makes so much sense why you would look at that, because that's what people are reporting in large quantities, right? But I also think that, again, especially when we're looking at a collective, when something, when an experience like burnout reaches the severity and prevalence that it does in the human services field, I think we're talking about something else. We can't be talking about an individual experience of burn, of um, like exposure to organizational stressors or job stressors, which is essentially what burnout is, right? It's occupational stress over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of the symptoms, so it made, anyway, so it made me think about how do we talk about these things at a systemic or a collective level? You know, if we're talking about mental health clinicians as a whole are more likely to experience burnout than some other um, non-helping professions. So I looked to um, some other theories uh, that were already established to measure collective experience. So I looked at things like collective trauma and systemic trauma. I looked at historical trauma really extensively. There are a few researchers in who have measured um, African-American historical trauma, indigenous historical trauma, and even like Kurdish historical trauma. And I, I looked at those theories not to equate the experience of like me, this little you know, clinician in New Hampshire who's <laughs> with with the, you know, systemic historical oppression of marginalized communities. It wasn't about equating experience. It was about, okay, these folks have been measuring collective experience for a long time. So what are they saying is important to look at? And they're looking at things like, they're looking at feelings. They're looking at anger, grief, loss, trust. They're looking at all of those things. And those are things that burnout as a construct doesn't really get to most of the time. Um, It's really focused on job factors. So it developed this construct that I called institutional systemic trauma to encapsulate that experience that like a group of professionals experiences as part of a system that is built in a way that takes advantage of them um, and is kind of a norm, like that that's the expected norm. And my the other part of that theory is that it can potentially even be passed down through generations of workers, through things like training and through collective narrative. So it got really interesting. I get a little bit nerdy about this stuff, but it's this really interesting piece around collective memory and how even if a trauma doesn't have a distinct date in history that it happened, the collective narrative about a harmful experience can become a social fact within a group. Mm -hmm. And then that social fact becomes part of what both keeps that group cohesive and what fragments it. So all at once, you know, I mean, we're looking at mental health clinicians as an example, they might feel really cohesive as a group. Like all clinicians have such a similar experience and we gain some kind of identity through that. And also like I'm all alone in what I'm experiencing, right? It's this really interesting dynamic. And so my research showed that this complex construct that I developed, and then I had to develop a scale for it, because if you develop a construct, you have to figure yeah. out how to measure it, right? That it is related. It's very strongly related to turnover. Um, and the other piece of my work was looking at, you know, if we structure leadership to be trauma-informed, can it help moderate that relationship at all? Um, which it turns out that it didn't do it enough. It wasn't okay. enough of a change. So for okay. me, that told me that an individual leader cannot be held responsible for mitigating an experience that's systemic. We have to look at how do we as organizations and institutions set ourselves up to keep this from happening or to, yeah, to prevent it to the best that we can and to know when it's happening and call it the right thing. Like call it burnout when it's burnout and call it institutional trauma when it's institutional trauma. Wow. That, I mean, that's huge because it's so easy to just label something as burnout 
then take a hard look at what, I mean, what just what came to mind is if you're that leader and you're recognizing signs to have that hard conversation and get the right people in the room to say, Hey, I see you. I hear you. We need to fix this. This isn't burnout. This is deeper. This is something that collectively as an organization we're creating. Mm -hmm. What would we, what would need to be different? Like as a, I'm really curious to see what some of your recommendations would be yeah. in that regard because, um, whew, that's yeah, just, it's heavy. Yeah. It doesn't feel good. You know, no. I, like I used the T word trauma really carefully cause I'm, I'm a trauma therapist. So I want to make sure that I'm, I'm honoring the weight of that word. Um, and I also want to honor the, what I think is a real experience, um, across in this case, you know, I really specifically measured mental health workers and it, it has been every time I've shared this research with mental health workers, they just, I get messages about how validated and seen they feel. And, you know, it's hard for people to talk about it. I think in a way other than burnout, even when we're experiencing it, because we don't always have language for those things. Yeah. Um, you know, and when we are trying to talk about something that we don't quite have language for, we borrow language that we do know and so for a really long time, clinicians have been told, oh, well, you're burnt out. And so they're like, oh, yeah, it must be burnout, right? But actually, when we think about the, how the system is structured itself, we can really see these signs that this is an institutional problem. And that gets tricky because no institution or organization wants to feel like they're traumatizing their people, right? That's not necessarily what this, yeah. what this is saying. Um, it's more about okay, we need to acknowledge that the way every system functions exactly the way it was set up to do. And so if we're going to own that, we need to look at how we're setting things up for clinicians. Because again, if all of your staff are burning out, that's probably not a staff problem. It's probably not that every single staff is not practicing good self-care. Right. That's not necessarily what that means. Um, I don't think that it means that practicing individual self-care is bad. That's not what that, that's not what I'm saying at all. But typically what happens when there's a burnout problem, an organization be like, okay, burnout, let's go to the research and see, okay, well, everything, if you look at research for burnout, you will absolutely find individual interventions aimed at self-care. Mm -hmm. um, and even burnout researchers, like some of the most famous ones, even in a, they published a chapter of a book this year and that I referenced in my, in my research that just basically said, you have to stop with the individual intervent interventions. It's not working. We have yeah. enough research about that. Yeah. So let's look at what can you do as an organization to make your culture more supportive and prevent the burnout in the first place. Because intervening after it happens has only been mildly successful if we can ever show it successful. But preventing it, that we can show is a lot more beneficial. Oh, yeah. It's like, what, what are we supposed to do? Double down on our meditation and yeah, then our right? workload uh, yeah, piles up? And we are still there. <laughs> I don't know how many self care trainings I've gone to that talk about the same, you know, three things like meditation and take a walk and drink a lot of water. <laughs> I'm like, <Yeah. laughs> listen, I <laughs> if if uh, if I'm being asked to produce a certain amount of work in too small amount of time, that stress is not going to go away because I drank my water quota that day. Exactly. You know, it's just not going to happen. And I think, you know, that self-care piece, it's, it's important, but it, it's, it doesn't fix, it doesn't fix. Right. The well, and, and, you know, there's a lot of folks are really into being, doing evidence-based practice, right? Like what does yeah. the evidence say that we should be doing? Well, the evidence is saying that teaching people individual self-care is not helping burnout. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means yeah. it's not actually solving the problem you're trying to solve, at least not by itself. So even things like the trauma-informed leadership construct that I studied in my research, it it was st statistically significant. It was. It was yeah. at a 0.3 level. So it was like a mild 
strong positive correlation. The more uh, trauma informed your leadership is, the less likely you'll have strongly perceived institutional trauma, right? The more trauma informed your leader is, the less likely someone is thinking about turning over. It's That's true. It's just mild. It's only part of it. So if you put every, if your burnout intervention is we're going to teach individual self-care or we're going to teach immediate supervisors to look out for the signs of burnout, those things are great. But all together, you're getting maybe up to half of the variance in burnout and institutional trauma. And you really want to do more than that, right? So, yeah, I feel like those two pieces enable deeper conversations. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing drinking, <laughs> drinking the water and meditating, that we might create some space to yeah. think and formulate thoughts to have a meaningful conversation and talk about well, and, and even think about mm -hmm. what do I need? What yeah. do I even ask for? Like if I'm on the hamster exactly. wheel, I don't yeah. have time. And then supervisors can recognize it. But yeah, there, there has to be a conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, I read a book called Real Self-Care by Dr. Pooja Lakshmi, and I highly recommend. Uh, and she talks about how, you know, it's not all bubble baths and getting your nails done. Like self-care is not that. Um, it's things like, are you setting good boundaries for yourself? Are you able to voice what you need? Um, you know, and those things, they, they are very individual practices, right? It's something that I have to reflect on. Am I setting good boundaries? Am I saying no? Am I saying whatever? Or just, you know, am I aware of what's going on? So that at work, when my supervisor asks me how I'm doing, I can say something like, you know, I'm feeling really, really overwhelmed. And I think it might be because I'm saying yes to too many things. And if we want me to be focused in this area, then I have to take some things off of my plate in this other area. And I don't know how to do that. That's a much different conversation than telling someone to meditate to reduce their stress, which again, is not a bad thing to do. I'm not right. just on meditation because that's true, but it's not going to solve the larger problem. Um, you so, just reminded I, me of something yeah. when you said, you know, when I'm clear, okay, I, 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 I'm saying yes to too many things and I need to take, take some things off my plate so I can focus here, but I don't know how to do that. How many leaders have you ever heard of? I know I've heard this plenty is don't come to me unless you have a solution. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> and then, you know, it's okay to not have a solution. I love how you stated that so beautifully. I, I think it's important to have that conversation as a starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, don't know I mean, the other, you know, that's the employee side, right? The other side yep. of that is having a supervisor that makes you feel psychologically safe enough to say that because I haven't always had supervisors where I could say, mm, I think this is too much or I don't know what to do. And, um, you know, most it's more common for people to have these feelings and then quietly leave, you know, and maybe if they're exit interviewed, they may or may not actually be honest about what's what has been happening. Yeah. Um, so both of those sides of that coin, the supervisor and the employee is so important. But again, I love to focus on the organization as a whole, because if you don't have a good culture, you're only going to be so successful. You're only going to be successful in the places where you have an individual supervisor who just really gets it mm -hmm. and has a great relationship with their employees. Cause that happens. You yeah. can have an organization in general. That's kind of, like not really up on its wellness stuff, but there might be maybe your individual supervisor is really great. But I know a lot of people who have really great supervisors and immediate supervisors only have so much power. They can't actually, you know, they might be able to be supportive, but they not, they're not usually able to make change. Right. And so now we have these elements, that individual element, that supervisory element, then how do we start to move it up to the, the system? How do we start to create change there? Sure. So I think um, when I talk about systems, and especially in my doctoral research, I was really talking about institutional systems. So like really, really big ideas, right? The institution of mental health as a whole. I think it's yeah. more um, pragmatic in this conversation to talk about like an organization as a system, right? That's usually probably where a lot of your listeners are going to be is having some kind of leeway within their organization. And I always come back to organizational culture. 
Like uh, I just did an interview for a couple of students at the University of New Hampshire. They were asking me something for a paper they were writing. And they asked me, you know, if you had all, if money wasn't an object and we're a nonprofit, so that's a, that's a tempting question, right? Yeah. If money was no object, what would you do? And I said, you know, I, there's that part of me that wants to say like, oh, we would expand our programming and we would add these things on. But I don't think I would actually say that in reality, because I need to make sure that my culture's right before mm -hmm. I grow anything, right? I could have all the money in the world and add things here and add things there. But if I don't have a foundation, it's all going to crumble eventually. And then I'm the big boss. So it's going to be my fault. So, yeah. uh, you know, so I, I uh, have done some work around how do organizations determine that they're ready for this? Like sometimes they'll, sometimes people will hear me talk about burnout or even about the kind of work that we do at, at the nonprofit I work for. And we'll be like, okay, what can we do? What can we do? What do we need to do next? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. before we take an action step, before we add a new program or like send out a new meditation app or add a new health benefit or whatever it is that we're going to do first, we need to figure out, are we even ready to have this conversation? Is our organization at a place where, this is going to be received. And so I, I use the analogy of um, like a home inspection yeah. that feels like something people are familiar with. Right. So like you want to make sure you have that good foundation uh, of one of the biggest pieces for me in that foundation, you know, there's, there's a couple of pieces, one of them being, is it already a part of your organizational values and mission to have, well-being for your employees, not just the people you're serving, but your employees. I come from human services, right? So we're always looking at people we're serving, but do you have that already baked in to your mission, vision, values? Is that a part of that conversation? And I also want to know if you were to decide to add something, if you're going to do some kind of initiative around wellness and you're going to make tell people, we're going to change our organization to help you prevent burnout. Are your employees going to believe you? Because most of the time, at least in the mental health field, there's been such a breakdown of social trust in organizations and institutions that the answer to that question is no, they won't yeah. believe you. And if you don't have their trust, you can send out every meditation app and you can let them know that they can have a gym membership reimbursed and they're just not going to take it as a meaningful attempt to care for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, okay. Do these things on your own time. <laughs> right. It is. There you and go. You know, there's this, um, for, for a little while, and th this still comes up a little bit, but there was a push by some people to make burnout a clinical diagnosis so that people could go to a therapist and say, I'm experiencing burnout and I need to have treatment for that. And then essentially, so insurance would reimburse that, right? Yep. Now, one of the things that I do align with, uh, with the burnout researchers who wrote about this, mostly Maslach, is when we do things like that, we're implying that the locus of the problem of burnout is within that individual and that the locus of responsibility for burnout is in that individual, which sounds a whole lot like blaming the victim. It sounds a whole lot yeah. like if you're experiencing burnout, that's on you for not having better self-care, better boundaries, whatever. And so what we need to do is get you to be able to handle it better. You know? yeah. And I think that that narrative has been so prevalent that again, if an organization asks, like, will our employees believe that we are genuine when we say that we want to change this? That's why I don't know that that answer is going to be yes for a lot of organizations. And if you are one of those, then you're fantastic. And I love that you're already a step ahead. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so building that, building that trust 
Mm -hmm. and having that conversation first and foremost, you you had me thinking about, and there's nothing wrong with wearing Fitbits and all that stuff. I'm not (laughs) knocking it, but like we're wear this device and we're going to track your activity. That's the problem. Oh, Laura, you're going to open a whole can of worms (laughs) if we talk about like, if we talk about actually what organizations put in their wellness programs, I have a lot of beefs with our over-focused on physical wellness and all of the biases that we hold around those. Some of that stuff is included in that like readiness Mm -hmm. um, inspection I was talking about. You know, some of this is that, you know, are employees going to believe you? Like if your wellness idea, if you're most, most organizations, if they're going to do like a really kind of push toward burnout prevention or incre- like increasing resilience or well-being if they're trying to take a preventive route. A lot of times it shows up as a wellness program, right? Yeah. Wellness programs usually really focus on physical well-being. They also are adding emotional well-being. So I will add that. I, I mentioned though pushing out another meditation app because nine times out of 10, if some if an organization is adding emotional well-being to their program kit, it's going to be an app about meditation. <laughs> I just don't yeah. know that that's always the number one answer when we're talking about emotional wellness, but it's going to be things like reimbursement for gym memberships. We'll buy you a Fitbit. We'll buy you a yeah. Peloton. Heck, like, well, whatever it is. And I just think, hmm, okay. So if all of your wellness initiatives are about nutrition, which usually is a facade for a diet, or physical activity, which is really um, eliminates the perspective of folks with different physical abilities, or, you know, if it's focused on like getting healthy and like, let's move and lose weight. And that is not going to make your folks who live in larger bodies feel like they're welcome. You know, there's a lot of things that go into those, um, those kinds of programming, that kind of programming that can actually be really off-putting and can say something about to your employees about what you care about as an organization. Not to mention if it's just really weirds me out when like bosses can have access to information about your physical health. Yeah. It's just yeah. like, That's that bizarre. is not a place that my no. supervisor needs to be. No Versus, thing. you know, like how can we create a culture uh, where it's psychologically safe to communicate and to, to see where there's redundancies and where we could support one another, where we can ask for support, where we can, where looking at the impact we have on other people is a priority Mm -hmm. where it's okay to speak up if we're overwhelmed or overworked. (laughs) We can. Yeah. And like where we can, where we are already taking action for things that we already know people have told us, right? So there's sometimes even a lot of pressure, I think, on individuals to be like, well, we want you to tell us when something's wrong. Well, I would argue that there have been a lot of people talking about some things that have been wrong. And so maybe we can add some of those things in. So for example, I use something, an example about, this is something I've actually done in my, in my new leadership role. So one of the things I've been doing to try to establish a culture of wellness, like safety, is um, taking note of our physical space, which is not a thing that a lot of people think about when they talk about organizational culture. But I know that you know, Laura, that like Mm -hmm. physical space can be an artifact of organizational culture. Yeah. And so sometimes there's not a whole lot you can do about your physical space. Like you have what you have, especially if you're coming in um, to an organization that already exists. And we're a nonprofit. So like we really have what we have. There's only so much, right? But we... I came in and the office where staff were was completely cluttered with just piles of paper because they didn't have a filing cabinet. They were working on desks that had clearly been like at the bottom of the donation pile that were all scraped up and like the drawers didn't open. Mm -hmm. Um, I sat down in one of the computer chairs and it just slowly sunk (laughs) down. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I just thought, what does this communicate about what matters here, you know? And not even that it was anyone's fault who came before me. That's not what I'm saying. It's not about someone being a bad boss or that the organization doesn't care. It's when someone, if someone knew where to come in, what would they think their value is 
in this or in this place. So one of the first things that I did, and I probably bothered my board with how much I talked about it, was like, we're buying new desks. We're buying chairs that stay where they're supposed to be when you sit yeah. in them. And we're buying chairs that it can accommodate people of any body size. We're buying desks that can be adjusted if someone is sitting in a chair versus if they need to stand because they experience back pain versus if they need to sit uh, because they're in a wheelchair, but it needs to be higher than it typically would be for, you know, a standard chair. So I spent so long looking at basic things like which chairs am I going to order for this office? But it's because they communicate things like that to people who come in. And if someone has to make an accommodation for themselves automatically, um, I just want to be aware of what that is. Like, can I make that accommodation first so that they can have the experience of, oh, someone else thought about that for me before I got here? Because yeah. that's a really beautiful experience for someone as opposed to like, oh, yeah, now I have to go to the boss and ask for something else. Like, if I can try to anticipate something um, and take that cognitive and emotional load off of them, mm-hmm. that immediately adds to their wellness. That's also why I did things like invested in our Wi-Fi, <laughs> because mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever worked on bad Wi-Fi. <laughs> yep. But I'm thinking my we work our organization provides services to survivors of human trafficking. Okay, that's a very stressful job. I would not want to go meet with someone who's in a very vulnerable state, potentially in a period in a sense of crisis. We're usually working with state systems that are not made for anyone <laughs> to go through yeah. well. And then they come back to the office and they sit in their chair that sinks down to the ground and they try to get on the state website and the Wi-Fi doesn't work. Yeah, horrible. That's going to lead to some frustration, which over time is going to build up and can lead to an like an overarching sense of frustration and not feeling seen or heard. That stuff can lead to burnout. So, yeah. you know, there are some things with physical space you can do to make sure that your organization set up well. And then there are things that I do um, relationally to set it up as well. So, um being really transparent um, in our hiring process. For example, we're in a period with our organization that's full of a lot of transformation, which is exciting for me because I love that stuff, right? And I'm making sure that when I hire someone that I'm really clear about what that might mean for them so that they can be clear on, is this a good fit for me right now? Mm -hmm. Because some people like me look at transformation and the ambiguity that comes with that. And we get really excited because we get to be creative and we get to make stuff. And other people are like, ambiguity is not my friend. And that would not be a good fit for me. And I wouldn't want to bring someone in who didn't know, who didn't know that was going to be a stress and felt like, Oh God, now we don't like, we don't know how we're going to do this. And now I have to figure it out. And what if I do it wrong? And all of those, right. all of those things, right? So I'm really clear about what kind of a environment they're coming into. I ask a lot about their values and if they're going to be a good fit, um, as well as making sure that we, you know, I, we have some folks with different kinds of lived experiences that can be um, really powerful strengths when you're working in this field. And they can lead to some vulnerabilities. And so then it's about setting up an expectation with each other of, you know, I'm going to want to check in with you around this in the future because we know that that will matter. So how are we going to do that? Like, how is that? How can I do that in a way that feels okay for you? Uh, How can, how often should I do that? I don't want to bug you. I don't want to do it every single time we meet if that's going to bother you, but I also don't want to do it once a year, at your annual review, you know? So yeah. negotiating some of the, that stuff with people directly and just setting up that you can come talk to me because I'm already bringing up the things that might be hard or that I might just want to talk to you about that will make both of us feel like we're human beings who can have an exchange. Hey, Luna. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, Luna. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's like when you, and this, I know this isn't all the things, but these are some things that people can start with. We have Mm -hmm. that awareness as an individual to know what we want and need. We have that awareness of leadership when to spot things. 
we can set up our space in a way that doesn't doesn't send the message we do more with less and you've got to fix your own problems no we're mm-hmm. we're doing this you know yeah. this is you know um i i think that's a, a really beautiful thing and and some things that not everybody who will be listening today to this episode um would think of mm-hmm. you know yeah. so these are some really practical things that you can okay. start to do and be aware of. Yeah. yeah. I know it might sound, sometimes it can be feel a little abstract of like, what would it, what is it even, what are you talking about organizational culture? What is that? Yeah. You know, what does it look like to have a culture of wellness or to have a, to do some systemic interventions for burnout? Some of them are really, really simple things, yeah. you know, it's building relationships and making sure that you're being inclusive in all of the ways that you can, you know, one of my, readiness questions is who say you have all you already have a program in existence you already have some some things that you're doing to try to um, improve employee wellness I like to ask who can walk through the front door to access those things and who has to climb through the window do you know who those people are (laughs) because if someone has to climb through the window or like shimmy up a fire escape to get in to access whatever it is you know obviously I'm being metaphoric here right um that's a that's a different like level of communication with your employee than the person who can just get in the front door and access it right away. Um, those are some things to be thinking about, like, who are we missing? Who's not here? Um, what voices do we need to be listening to? Yeah. It's seeing people mm-hmm. and considering their needs, their challenges, their objectives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, I think the work that I'm doing here as the, as a leader is um, trying to set that up and then, and really collaborating with the stuff that I am bringing on to have them be a part of it because it helps, you know, I want them to feel ownership over the things that we're doing. And then, I mean, even like back to that individual thing, the thing that we do, right. Cause we do have agency over some, what we experienced was when I was accepting this job, I, I almost actually said no at first specifically because I was worried about boundaries okay, and about like, and about work-life balance. Yeah, And I was able to talk with the board of directors about that really openly and say like, this is, these are my experiences. This is what I'm coming in with. I do have a history of burnout and I don't always see it right when I need to. And I don't want to get into that experience again. So, you know, they said, well, like we're willing to support you. And I was like, something that would be really helpful is if you told me how you plan to support me, like specific, what would that look like for you to support me in this role? And then, then I felt comfortable saying, yes, I will come on and do this. Um, But that, and that was my personal practice of the next time I take a job, I want to be really clear about what are my needs? What do they what can they offer to me and where, where is that good match? And it's also why when I interview staff now, I ask them, what have you learned that you need to feel successful and balanced and satisfied at work? Like, what do you need for that to happen? Because I want to make sure that I'm going to be able to meet that or not. Like maybe it won't be a good match. Yeah. So those are some more of those, those simple like one-on-one individual things that you can ask yourself if you're a leader, like, are you doing that for your employees? And if you're searching for jobs that you can start doing uh, and it might maybe sometimes get you a little bit of a funny look. I think sometimes I do things just because I know that I believe in them. And if someone reacts a little bit oddly, then that's on them. And then maybe it's just not a good fit. Yeah. It's better to know it. Yeah. This, I I think this conversation has been gold and I think, People who are listening today are going to get so much out of this on a personal level to feel empowered or validated even Mm -hmm. in what they might be experiencing. But even as um, leaders and people in positions to make decisions and affect change to really look at some of these simple things to start doing that, having those meaningful conversations, seeing others, um, and starting with something as simple as what is your space like? How mm-hmm. is it serving? Um, but I, I'm so grateful for our conversation today and, you know, and the important research and work that you've 
really poured into this because it's going to serve so many people. And I'm so grateful that you shared it here with us and our listening audience. I'd love to. I love it. I love it. And clearly I can talk about it for days and days <laughs> without stopping. I'm just so glad that you're doing a series on this and not just like a token episode. You know, I think I see yeah. that sometimes the token episode, the token chapter in the book, like, oh yeah, burn hours. <laughs> yeah. And, meditate. You know, <laughs> drink water. Is- yeah, right. Drink water. But you probably should drink water. Just as well, yes. <laughs> and and meditate too. Yeah, those are all good things. But uh, I just appreciate that you're dedicating time to this because I know it is something that isn't talked about a ton. And hopefully my experience will be helpful. To oh my gosh, absolutely. Um, well, anything else that we didn't cover that you want to close with as we wind down this episode of Rat Race Reboot? Uh, let me see. I think maybe just some of the resources that I have have been really helpful for me as an individual, like trying to navigate some of this stuff is, um, I think I already mentioned Dr. Pooja Lakshmi's book, Real Self Care. Okay. Um, I also highly recommend Rethinking Wellness by Christy Harrison. She's a registered dietitian and she talks about like wellness culture and what that all means now. And, um, there's another one, decolonizing wellness that really looks at like how we think about ourselves, um, which is fantastic. So, you know, some of those, there are much more brilliant uh, people out there in the world who've been talking about this longer than I have. And they have some really, really great resources and they do some really great speaking engagements. Oh, one of my other favorites is Anna Greenwald. She owns a, she's a CEO of a wellness company called, um, on the Goga. Mm -hmm. And she does a Ted talk called why wellness sucks. (laughs) (laughs) And she talks about that whole thing. So those are some places I would say to go learn from some people who have been doing this longer than I have even, and have some really great resources too. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank Mm -hmm. you again for pouring into our listeners. And I'm sure we'll, we'll have another conversation in the future. I hope so. (laughs) All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this week's episode of Rat Race Reboot. Remember, everything is created twice, first in our minds and then in our physical beingness and form. So we are excited to see you again next week. So tune in.